Today we welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe an amazing person, a producer of Red Rooster Lounge, Gary Wolfson. I have to say that every Saturday night I make sure that I go out for my walk at 9 o'clock in the evening, specifically in order to listen to his show. The selection of blues items that he presents, I mean, there's blues on that radio station 90.9 here from, I think, 8 o'clock till 4 o'clock in the morning. And his hour is one hour from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And I go out specifically at 9 o'clock in order to walk and listen to his show. Besides selections of blues, he also introduces them with his little uh, poetic shticks, uh, you know, just rhymes, and, uh, and I have to say it's amazing. I'm amazed that every time he finds something to say, you know, and that it rhymes. Kerry, uh, welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to be here. I'm nice to be having anywhere. <laughs> nice having you. Now, the reason I asked, I have to say this. I did not know until a few days ago that Kerry was white and Jewish. I thought that he was black. And I have to say, this is my prejudice. I always thought that only blacks can do blues. Because several times, more than several times, I heard whites doing blues. And I have to say, um, they did not come up to um, Muddy Waters or B.B. King or somebody else like this, at least in my own mind or imagination. So, and when I heard, you know, this uh, Red Rooster Lounge, uh, blues were great and the person introducing this blue sounded black. Kerry, do you have any black in you? You know, it's hard to say, man. I, I, my wife and I were just talking today about never wanting to have a DNA test. So, because who knows what you'll find out. Um, somewhere in my soul, certainly. In my DNA, I have no idea. No idea. Uh, do you know where your parents were born? My parents were born um, on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. my, mother, my mother in Baltimore and my father in South Carolina. What about your grandparents? My grandparents were from... Uh, my grandparents on my mother's side were from a shtetl in Eastern Europe, from Ukraine, I think, or... You know, um, Russia, I did all, you know, all that stuff kind of blended together. Mm. And uh, on my father's side, a couple generations before that, but also from the same region. So I contacted you because I had a question. I was thinking, you know, blues, I love blues, but do they have anything to do with Jews other than rhyming? And I wrote it to you with this question, and you responded with a whole list of all kinds of Jews taking or connected in some way to blues, to performance, to writing, to producing. Could you please tell us something about it? Well, the, um, that list I gave you, start, it started off with a presentation that I did a year and a half ago, maybe, uh, at the Jewish Community Center in Boulder, Colorado, which is where I live. Um, they were doing uh, s some programs on rhythm and blues and soul music and contacted me and I said, well, I'm, you know, Motown, you can have somebody else do that for you. But um, blues and R&B, sure. And as a matter of fact, 
uh, not surprisingly, uh, what was when when blues was first being recorded, which would basically have been in the 30s and and more more so in the 40s. Um, the business end was what was open to Jews, as was often the case about almost anything. Um, and so you had people like the Chess Brothers there in Chicago. Uh, their, their name was Chiz, and they were from a shtetl in Poland. And uh, they came as immigrants around the turn of the 20th century to Chicago, changed their name to Chess, and um, started off owning a oh, uh, liquor store, and then a bar, and then a nightclub, and, um, you know, discovered that their patrons, who were mostly black, um, you know, this was the kind of music they were into, and started creating a record company out of out of whole cloth, and there were plenty of other people like that. Um, in Los Angeles, there were the Bahari brothers that started um, Merc Modern Records and Meteor Records. There was Art Roop, who is still alive, who founded Specialty Records, which was the label that Sam Cooke was originally on, and Little Richard, and a whole bunch of people. Um, Art's in his late 90s now and sharp as a tack from what I can tell. And so there were plenty of others like that. Uh, in terms of, of musicians, you know, not so much and, and more so recently. Although back in the day, in the 40s, um, Doc Pomus was a great songwriter whose his real name was Jerome Felder. And uh, he had a partner named Mort Schumann. So um, Doc Thomas wrote a ton of great songs and produced a ton of great records and uh, had kind of a salon in his apartments in, in New York City where people would come all the time and, and see him and hang out with him and get high with him. You mean whatever. blues? Blues? No, R&B, whatever. You know, when there were, he was, uh, yeah, there, you know, he, he, uh, he, he adopted the name Doc Pomus because um, he didn't think that his it would sit well with his family to know that Jerome Felder was making rhythm and blues records. Um, Why, were they prejudiced or it was just simply uh, a, a geist of that time? I think it was both. <laughs> you know, it's like... You know, it was, it, it seemed like, I, I'm sure to them, it was the kind of thing that was for the Schwarzes, to put it bluntly. And um, nonetheless, I mean, he, he became quite an important figure. And then there were tons of songwriters and producers, as um, you were saying, uh, uh, Mike Lieber and Jerry, Jerry Stoll, no, Mike Lieber and Jerry Stoller, who, um, or Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, God, now it's, I think it's Jerry. You mean uh, 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 that uh, little guy and tall woman? What's, no, it was, um, no, th no, these were two different guys. Two, two different. <laughs> yeah, Jerry, I, I, now I have to look it up. Jerry, I think it's Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, who <laughs> wrote all these songs for groups like the Coasters mm. and, um, Tons of other people. They were they were big time songwriters and producers. Um, even Carol King, who she and her husband Jerry Goffin were um, were uh, songwriters in New York and wrote wrote songs. You know, before Carol became a big time uh, recording artist with her album Tapestry. You know, she was writing songs for rhythm and blues singers. Um, Will you still love me tomorrow? And natural woman. And what was the attraction for these Jews to go into this particular genre? 
I don't know, what was the attraction for me to go into this particular genre? I liked the music. Okay, <laughs> then they let's like go. the music, or they could, you know, maybe um, some of it had to do with they could sell records this way, they, you know, that they... Then let's, uh, I'm sorry, I have a little problem with the uh, screen. Uh, it's jumping, but uh, so now we're side by side. I wanted you to be in the center, but let's see what happens. Um, now, so so what what made you attracted to blues? Well, my blues um, moment, I guess. I you know I was uh, I was in college in the 1960s and in fact in fact even before then when I was in high school when I was in high school it got to the point where whenever I go out with kids everybody was into top 40 music and uh, the the blackest music that they would listen to was Motown and Motown was a big deal back then and you know I liked it all right like everybody else did. But I kept feeling like there's something else. There's something more. There's something. There, there, there's something better than Motown. Something deeper. Than yeah. That. And um, I start. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. There were several really great rhythm and blues radio stations with black DJs with great personalities. Um, uh, the most famous one of them was uh, Hot Rod Halbert. Hot Rod was had been in New York and I think Philadelphia as well. He's in the uh, National Broadcasting Hall of Fame, and he had this great jive pattern. Uh, take the nod from the rod. <laughs> he, he 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 could talk jive. Like this this is this is where you you pick he, your. I, I, you know, I'm not a patch on what he could do. Really. Uh, he could just he could just riff it off the top of his head. Because I, I I have not heard him, but I heard you, and I am amazed. You are terrific um, in, the, in that particular hot, area. Hot hot rod. There was another guy named Fat Daddy, who in Baltimore was he was a legendary um, disc jockey. Um, Rock and Robin was another one, and so all these guys. You know, it wasn't just a dry recital of. Uh, and now we're going to hear, you know, right. I mean, these guys had personalities to them. And so did the music. You know, I started hearing all kinds of stuff that you would never think you could have heard on the radio. I mean, people like Albert King and B.B. King and Bo Diddley and um, plus, you know, the deeper soul artists of the day. Little Willie John. I mean, that was somebody... We heard all the time uh, that you know most most white kids still don't know who he is, and um, so I so I was listening to that. I was kind of primed by listening to that. When I when I went to college, um, I had a friend who would bring in bands, and he'd bring in these soul bands, and you know so we we'd dance our butts off to these soul bands. And, you know, that, I mean, a lot of the popular music of the day, Sam and Dave, people like that. And the, but the one shining moment was in 1967, going to the Howard Theater in Washington, D.C. and seeing the James Brown Review. And that was a life-changing experience. James Brown, huh? Uh, we were... We, I mean, we weren't maybe the only white kids in the audience, but it was close. And, you know, he... Did he ask you what you white kids are doing here? Nah, he, no. he, he just wanted our green, <laughs> man. <laughs> That's all he cared about. Um, and, you know, I mean, the whole... It was a whole review. It wasn't just James Brown, but then he would, he would pop out and do a duet with somebody, and then he'd come out and do his whole set with the cape and please, 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 and dancing around on one leg and all that stuff. Well, that really, you know, that that was a, a, a turning point for me. And the next turning point for me, who's going to be seeing this? I'm curious. 
who, who are you going to show this to? <laughs> well, so I know how much I can say. <laughs> you can say whatever you like. But I, I, I have to say, who, who is listening and what we're going to try to do besides uh, English speakers in America, we're going to also try to adapt some of the material that I got from you in order to um, present it to Russian speakers. And I think that the audience among Russian speakers is going to be vastly larger than American audience because Russians love blues. Wow. Okay. All right. So in 1970, in October of 1970, um, I was going through my psychedelic phase at that time. I had been to San Francisco. I'd been to see the Grateful Dead, who I totally fell in love with. And uh, one night I, I had, we had done some uh, mescaline and gone to a Chinese restaurant. And when the food started crawling around on my plate, I decided it was time to leave. And I went downstairs and next door, there was a record store. And I bought two records there that had just come out. One was Layla by Derek and the Dominoes, Eric Clapton. And the other was called Hooker and Heat. And it was John Lee Hooker and Canned Heat. Uh, both great albums. And that night, I went back to my um, apartment. I, I also didn't know at the time that I was coming down with strep, th strep throat. So I was definitely in an altered state of music, uh, altered state of mind. And listening, to, so the, the Canned Heat and John Lee Hooker album built from uh, John Lee Hooker solo and then members of the band joining him and eventually at the end, all of them jamming together. But at first it was John Lee Hooker with his guitar and just stomping. And I mean, it just went through me and it was like, holy cow, this is everything I like about rock music peeled away to the absolute bedrock. This was it. This was the root. And I took off from there. I never stopped. I, you know, I had a job. Uh, I was out of college in 1969. I but, was working. but Gary, but why? Why? Was you being Jewish had something to do with this affection? I don't think so. <laughs> I just think it was. Meaning you did not go to psycho, you know, psychoanalyst and lay down on a couch and answered all the questions? No, no, no. You know, I mean, it. Why do people like Britney Spears? Why do people like Muddy Waters? What's the difference? I, I, I know like, I, I know I like, like I know I like Muddy Waters. I don't like Britney Spears. So okay, so that's the answer. I mean, you know, it does not resonate with me. Britney right, Spears right. does not resonate. I, I mean, you know, it's it. I don't think it's well. I mean, at, at a certain level, there's obviously parallels in the fact that. Um, you know, you and I and Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker are all descended from slaves. Uh, so somewhere in our genetic memory, I suppose, there's something, there's some kind of cross resonation there. I don't know. I, 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 I would not go that far to slaves. Maybe I was purchased along the ride. But, uh, <laughs> but I have to tell you this. In my own life, I had experiences that uh, resonate way more with blues than with uh, some light-hearted, nice thing. Well, I mean, you know, for, for me, I mean, I resonate with blues more than I do with... Um, uh, God, I can't, I'm trying to think of the name of it now, but... Um, traditional Jewish music. Like what? What is traditional Jewish well, I'm, well, music? I, I was trying, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm just having a brain cramp right now where, mm -hmm. where, where I can't, I can't think of what I, what I'm meaning to say. You, um, you don't like Klezmer? Klezmer. That's exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, actually, I, I mean, I do like Klezmer because it's basically jazz. Um, 
uh, tomorrow I'm going to have here in my house for dinner one of the best uh, Klezmer uh, uh, yeah. violinists, you know. But um, I'm going to tell him that you almost like Klezmer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't dislike Klezmer. Okay. Uh, I'll put it that way. And, uh, I mean, I've been to New Orleans 25 times, something like that. But Jews yeah, I mean, cannot sing blues. Well, that's not entirely true. I gave you a long list of people. Yeah, I saw, I saw that list, and I saw, you know, I'm proud to be Jewish and things like this, and as much as that. By the way, thank you very much, you know. And we're gonna use it, and we're gonna make something out of it. But I have to say, still, you know, wow, some of the it just, I don't know, you know, maybe I'm preju well, prejudiced, I, but my, you know, personally, I I get a chance to listen to a ton. Of music releases. Uh, for 12 years, I published Blues Access magazine. And so, you know, I would probably get 500 releases a year, something like that, you know, so something on that, on that order. And uh, even, uh, and even now, you know, because of the radio show, people are sending me music, and then I have places where I can go to find music online. And like you, if I'm looking at 10 new releases where I don't really know anything about these bands, but one of them is black, and I only have one to download, that's probably the one I'm going to download. You know, because I have... So I have so many records that, uh, you know, I, I call um, bands like Joe and the Six Packs. They're just they're they're bar bands who would probably be fun to listen to if you were drinking in a bar and they're playing blues. And I've heard plenty of those bands that are fun to, to hear. But in terms of recording artists, um, yeah, that's that's definitely. Right. And in terms of feeling of authenticity, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, of just course. of course, of course. But then again, um... and, and this is, by the way, the question I wanted to ask you because I wondered about my own uh, judgment and my own assessment of this because I was thinking maybe I'm just prejudicial. Maybe I think that blacks, you know, because the music originated with them, therefore it is this way, and maybe I'm just exaggerating this element. But I feel it, you know, when I hear it, I feel it. I, I, I um, can't help it. I, I mean, I can't, I, I wouldn't argue with that. I, I you know, there's definitely uh, the ring of authenticity in, you know, we're, we're, we're talking, we're generalizing about big groups of people. So generally speaking, yes, that's true. I think so, too. Can, can, that, can doesn't you... mean, that doesn't mean never in either case okay you, know, you take somebody like like michael bloomfield okay he, he was not a great vocalist he was a blindingly good guitar player and um if you if you look on youtube for a film called festival which uh is, is a documentary with shots from some of the early 60s Newport Folk Festivals. So there's Bob Dylan, electric, with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, including Bloomfield, backing him up. You know, and, 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 but tons of, it's, it's a great film. It's an absolutely great film. And I have taught a class at a music and art camp in Maryland called Common Ground on the Hill for well, since 1997, so however, however many years that is, 24 years, something like that. Maybe this is 25. And um, I always show parts, parts of that film. And it's Bloomfield talking about um, Paul Butterfield, talking about Muddy, talking about Sun House, and how he says, you know, hey, look, I didn't grow up with the blues. I'm Jewish. My father was a multimillionaire. You know, I'm not like Son House who's been shit on and pissed on. And you hear that in his music. I'm not like that, but I, I can play the blues. 
but not like that. But he definitely can play the blues. I mean, he's one of my favorite guitar players ever. And no doubt about it. No yeah. doubt about it. But so, still, his singing does not count. Well, he's just not a good singer. <laughs> well, that's, that's it. But he plays well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, Red Rooster Lounge. Mm -hmm. You do it every week, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we are, We're on show number... I just... The one that aired Saturday night was show number 1,829. Wow. This is nice. That's you're not, you're not tired of doing it? No, I love it. You love, I love it? Yeah. It. Yeah. Did, and I've had definitely had to make some uh, adjustments due to the pandemic. In what way? Uh, I used to re go in every week and record during the week at our local community radio station, KGNU in Boulder. Uh, because of the pandemic, they've severely limited who can come into the station. And they've closed off the uh, production studios, except for, you know, in-station work. So I had to come up with a way to record the show in my basement, which is where I'm sitting right now, even though you see these beautiful trees behind me. <laughs> I thought uh, uh, that was my question. Where, 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 where do you get such a nice uh, background? <laughs> uh, I created this. I'm a photographer and a digital artist. So, uh, I, I took a look at some of your pictures. They're amazing. And I... Uh, suggest uh, anybody else uh, uh, that may be interested in very creative use of digital photography to go to uh, uh, Kerry Wolfson, um, uh, what is it, Access? Uh, uh, well, um, the, if, you're on, if you're on Facebook, you can... My we're we're going to put link to it yeah. below the video. My, my, my public page, page is Kerry Wolfson Photographic Arts. Okay. Facebook, so you can so, see a lot of it there, and I'm also on Instagram and um, some other places. But, but anyway, getting, but but uh, getting back, getting back yeah. to Jews and blues, mm -hmm. because this is of interest to me. You say you say so. Kleismer is not your cup of tea, and of course, uh, I have to say that Kleismer. I was born in the Soviet Union, and despite the fact that music came from that part of the world from what is now Ukraine, Romania, Moldova, whatever, Poland a little bit. Uh, I, in the Soviet Union, nobody ever heard of Klezmer. Because in the Soviet Union, Jews were not allowed to open their mouths as Jews. And Klezmer is a Jewish, uh, Part of Jewish traditional culture, not not quite traditional culture, but uh, because music is not really part of approved by Orthodox synagogue way of communicating, of uh, exploring, uh, of having relationship with people. But for some reason, blues, you know, I do not know, because maybe it's American, uh, and then when I start listening to it, it just got into me, just into my, you know, kishke, you know, into my inside, you know. It just, th this is amazing to me, it's, even I mean, even when I don't drink. Sure. I mean, it's, if people, so I was saying before about Britney Spears and Muddy Waters, okay? People who like Britney Spears or any of the, you know, cheesy pop stars of the, uh, of whatever current day it happens to be, uh, are relate they relate to music on a different level. Maybe it's just something to dance to. Maybe it's just something that's catchy to them. Maybe it's what all their friends listen to. And I went through all this. Like I said, I you know I started steering towards R and B and blues when all my friends all they ever wanted to listen to was Top Forty and Motown. And I kept feeling like, no, there's something deeper than this. There's something deeper than this. And I think either it's in you or it's not. Or, you know, or you are able to attune to it or you're not. The or you're not exposed to it or you've never been exposed to it. But assuming that you've been exposed to it and you don't like it, then, you know, like they say, if you've got a hole in your soul, 
you're not going to like it. A hole in your soul. You know, this is, this is from those little snippets of poetry that you introduced. <laughs> well, that's a common one. That's, I've stolen that one. <laughs> okay, so that's good. Steal it, but the way you do it and the, in, at the appropriate place. When you were giving presentation at JCC in Colorado, you know, on Jews and uh, blues, mm -hmm. what kind of reaction did you get from the audience? Oh, they loved it. <laughs> Why? What, 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 what did they like about it? What, they what? Were, you know, it was, it was an older crowd. It was a more mature crowd. So what, uh, I don't know whether you've had a chance to listen to the music I sent you, but the, a little bit, the, the list of it, you know, I mean, right. it started off, it starts off with the, all the schlocky stuff I used to hear when I wasn't old enough to reach up and change the dial on the radio from what my mother was listening to. So that was stuff like the Andrews sisters and Georgia Gibbs, or who, who was actually, she was Jewish too, by the way. And, um, and then, and then find the, the, the progression of it was, so this stuff. And then when I was able to listen to like top 40 radio and hear people like Pat Boone or Peggy Lee, and then discover that the songs that they were making popular and making money off of were songs that they'd ripped off from black artists. So, what do you mean by ripped off? Well, they cut. You know, um, Little Willie John puts out a song. Somebody, some producer, some some record company person hears it and goes, "Well, okay, Fats Domino puts out a song." Mm -hmm. And some record company person goes and says, that would sound good done by Pat Boone. So mm -hmm. they quickly get out a copy of the same song. Um, Ain't that a shame? Mm -hmm. was one of them. Um, they, got, they, they put out a version of it. That one makes all the money. And Fats Domino's version gets buried. But Fed's dominant versions of this song still much better than Boone's. Well, of course, that does, that's irrelevant. Irrelevant. That's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. We're talking mm -hmm. about pop music now. We're talking about mass audiences. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like I said, the people at large, pop audiences at large, then today, same thing. Either, either you're able to relate to the grittier stuff, or you're not. And if you're not, you're not going. You're going to want to hear Pat Boone rather than Fat Domino. Or that's what you heard. I mean, in my case, that's what I heard. It took it took a while before I realized, oh, oh, that's where this came from, you know? And oh, this this guy, wait, he's not doing a Pat Boone song. Pat Boone is doing his song. That's but I mean, it took that kind of re realization. So getting back to my presentation at the JCC, um, I started playing all this stuff and, you know, people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, like me, um, you know, they recognize it. And when they, and then when I go from like Pat Boone to Little Richard doing a wop, bop, a loo, bop, a wop, bam, boom, everybody reacted to that. So I, I managed to hook them in with the stuff that was familiar to them mm -hmm. from the radio and you so know, are, are you saying that they, they so they're in, they must have been interested so. uh, are you saying that they just were reacting to their youth well they were re reacting to stuff that they recognized mm -hmm. i mean like I, they came to my presentation so they must have a little bit of interest in what i'm presenting was there a lot of them i guess there were maybe 30 people there or something like 30 that. people well i do not know how many jews in colorado maybe oh, no, there's there's a lot more than that <laughs> there's, a lot more there. <laughs> there's plenty especially in boulder and boulder and denver there's plenty of them and i know plenty of them but um uh, and what kind of a questions did they ask you well i don't really remember because i i, I only had so much time so mm -hmm. i was basically presenting 
pretty much the whole time. I don't even know if we had time for a Q and A because they they hustle this out pretty fast. So as I understand, Jews and blues, Jews are producers. What about writers. the writers? What about the composers? Or there's no composers. Well, I mean, there's composers of rhythm and blues songs, mm -hmm. and we have to separate what blues. I call rhythm and blues from what nowadays is called rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with, with with blues. You know, it's it's commercial. It's black commercial music is what it, what mm -hmm. what what gets called rhythm. But, you know, when we're talking about stuff um, from the 40s, 50s and 60s, uh, they were taking songs, you know, it's just, the blues artists were pretty much doing back porch blues songs. Although, you know, pe even back in the day, people like Robert Johnson or Skip James or or Sun House or Book of White. I mean, you know, we don't have recordings of this, but when they did sh when they did shows in in clubs, you know, they they would do their versions of popular popular songs of the day. Mm -hmm. Even those guys would. I mean, you know, it wasn't the heart of what they did, but it's what people wanted to hear. So you hook them with that. You hook them with the familiar, and then, but but also put your own spin on it. Mm -hmm. But so song, but but I mean, you know, people like Carol King and her first husband Jerry Goffin, you know, they they were writing R and B songs. Lieber and Stoller, they were writing R and B songs for R and B groups like the Coasters. And um, I, you know, I don't have my notes right in front of me right now, but I could reel off a bunch more if I did. We'll do it, uh, 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 you know, because as I told you in uh, uh, previous uh, conversation in our email, we're going to prepare something uh, to reproduce because unfortunately your presentation at the GCC uh, was not filmed. Right. We're going to produce something based on notes that you provided and on uh, uh, files that you provided. We're going to produce something in order to reproduce that presentation because uh, I'm very interested in uh, this uh, topic from the point of view of Jews relating to the non-Jewish world. And in different societies, in different cultures, it's done a little bit differently. And in this particular time and place, with regard to blues, for some reason, you know, as I said, you know, at least in... Uh, my own gut, it resonates. Mm -hmm. So, we'll do it, and then uh, we'll we'll do it. Uh, hopefully, with your help, with your you know direct or indirect supervision or whatever, whatever else, and um, we'll show, and hopefully, people will understand it a little bit better. Uh, Gary, I thank you very, very much for everything that you provided and for the time you've spent with us. And I will now listen, walk on Saturday at, at 9 o'clock in the evening, listen to your Red Rooster Lounge, and know exactly who I'm listening to. <laughs> and I hope that all of our uh, 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 members and viewers and readers and whatever it is, they are going to listen because blues for Jews is cool. Cool in terms of it, uh, it, 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 it makes you feel better. At least it makes me feel better. Well, yeah. It chases away the blues. And as they say in China, Gary, Zai Gizint. <laughs> okay. And the best, and Zeig is in to all of our, let them subscribe. Let them not forget to subscribe to our Chicago Jewish Cafe. And right. hope to talk to you again. All right. Yeah, nice I, talking to you. Alexander, and best of luck to you. Thank you, and, and you too. Everybody out there, keep the blues alive. Yes, absolutely, with your help. Okay. Nice talking to you. Bye. Take care.